Thank you for joining us for this webinar on biodiversity, cultivating the future, nature-based solutions for sustainability, held in partnership with China Dialogue. I'm Hannah Bretherton, the Lao China Institute's Impact and Engagement Manager, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this session as part of our inaugural China Week. Today's event looks at the challenges facing China's natural environment, the links between biodiversity loss and climate change, and how governments, the private sector and environmental groups can work together to put a stop to the overuse and destruction of the natural world. We are very pleased to have an incredible lineup of panelists for you today, including Dr. Sam Deal, CEO of China Dialogue, Dr. Jinfeng Zhou, Secretary General of the China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation. Dr. Li Guo, Environmental Research Associate at the Lao China Institute at King's. And John Dodsworth, Senior Program Advisor at the WWF UK, who is also the recently announced winner of the Lao China Institute and Young China Watchers 2021 essay competition for his analysis on deforestation in China. We also have a brilliant panel moderator today, Vincent Ni, who is the China Affairs Correspondent for The Guardian. Before I welcome Vincent to the screen, a quick note about the format. Each speaker will provide a short presentation on their topic area before we bring everyone to the screen for a panel discussion. And there will be time for audience Q&A. So make sure you have your questions ready to put in the box at the bottom of the screen. I'm now pleased to introduce our panel chair for today's session, Vincent Ni. Nee. Welcome, Vincent. Thank you very much, Hannah. Good morning, everyone joining us from London and good evening to those dialing from China. Our diversity protection and the climate emergency have traditionally been treated as two separate sets of policy challenges. But this year, the United Nations said it wants to tackle them together, looking at the social and environmental impacts of both. China's vast landmass is biologically diverse. It's home to some 14% of the world's animals and 10% of the world's plant species. The Chinese government introduced ecological protection in its constitution in 1983, and more recently in 2018, it added a constitution amendment to enshrine the protection of what it calls the ecological civilization. But despite this, China's rapid growth over the past three decades has put a great strain on native species and habitats, and their habitats, and China's precious natural world remains under threat today. While the COP26 is due to commence next week, earlier this month, China also hosted a phase one of COP15, which seeks to bring about ambitious change to minimize biodiversity loss and protect the natural environment. Now, the next hour also, we'll be hearing four diverse perspectives and what's happening in China on this front, both through international cooperation and Beijing's own domestic policies. So if you have any questions, like Hannah said, uh, if you have any questions along the way, please do send them in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer them as uh, much as possible in our discussion later. Now, without, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Sam Gill, CEO of China Dialogue. Welcome, Sam. Thanks, Vincent. Um, it's a real pleasure to be part of this panel um, and to be uh, co-hosting this, this session. Um, I um, thought that I'd just set up a few um, initial thoughts and remarks around China's role in helping to um, stay the course on international cooperation in response to the biodiversity crisis and how that relates to climate. Um, say something quickly about the sort of synergies between nature and climate and why we need to keep those in, in mind and, and sort of work across those related multilateral conventions and indeed just related areas of, of, sort of nature and, um, and response to uh, the sustainability crisis. 
and to maybe touch on some of the um, uh, points that have been raised by uh, in the opening session of the Convention on Biological Diversity in Kunming and, and Xi Jinping's opening speech, um, so that we can then sort of return to that, I hope, in the discussion. I mean, very briefly, the, the science is clear. We're facing an unprecedented loss of biodiversity driven by unsustainable changes in how we manage our land and seas. This is not only putting nature at risk, but our own health and prosperity, the health and prosperity of indigenous peoples and local communities, as well as, um, as, as people who are you know, relying on the, on the fruits of, of nature through global supply chains and, and the broader uh, kind of economic system. Um, and there is a deep relationship with climate change. We cannot address um, the biodiversity crisis without uh, addressing climate change, which is one of the major drivers of, uh, of the destruction of nature. Um, but also if we want nature to be part of the solution to climate change, we need to preserve it and we need to really up those efforts enormously. Um, despite the enormity of that problem, the international community hasn't really focused on, uh, on this problem, um, uh, given it, certainly in comparison, for example, to the uh, scrutiny and prominence uh, that has been put on the UN Climate Convention and on other global challenges such as the, the pandemic. Um, in part, it's because it's very difficult to actually express and sort of coalesce around shared goals and implementation uh, measures to address the, the nature crisis. It's a lot more diffuse in nature and the uh, Convention on Biolog Biological Diversity that addresses it uh, doesn't have the same kind of uh, teeth or, or, or financing um, that its counterpart has. Um, but in the last two or three years, we have seen significant growth in the political attention and the initiatives, crucially, that are designed to address it, including some um, sort of uh, coalescence around the need for a post-2020 framework under the Convention on Biological Diversity. The last 10-year um, framework that, that um, stemmed from the Aichi uh, Accords has widely been seen as quite ineffective. Uh, there are a number of big targets that were not reached. Um, and now at Kunming, uh, there is a, uh, a process in place to create the next 10 years of a biological diversity uh, protection framework that might actually be more effective, might have more implementation measures associated with it, but also be ambitious. And much of that is coordinated around a call for a global goal to halt and reverse bio bio biodiversity decline by 2030. Um, and China plays a very important role at Kunming in trying to push forward that agenda. Um, China, of course, has become a far more proactive and sort of leading player in the climate talks, and that's much better known. Um, you know, China moved from being sort of widely cast as the villain of the uh, Copenhagen talks back in 2009 to being seen really, uh, I think, rightly in a sort of leading position when it comes to, uh, to, to climate talks and to its position globally on um, the technologies that will be needed to address the, the climate crisis. Um, the position that China now takes in leading, uh, you know, as the, the president of the CBD COP15, I think is going to rightly mean that China's sort of prominence in these debates is going to rise and it's going to be under greater scrutiny. Of course, that is itself a double-edged sword. It means that uh, China will be at once aware that it can step up and be uh, recognized for its contributions to quote unquote ecological civilization, a you know, very important kind of signature leadership brand for Xi Jinping that um, sits and uh, aligns with the idea of the so-called ecological red lines, which I think China is very keen to export. But at the same time, it also means that uh, you know, there, there might be politically contentious uh, debates between the countries that are, for example, less um, uh, less progressively aligned on biodiversity protection, such, such as Brazil and the more um, uh, ambitious kind of uh, countries, um, you know, represented by by some of the uh, least developed countries, and also countries like uh, uh, you know in in Europe and so on that are pushing for higher targets. Um, what sort of uh, position will China take in relation to that contention, I think is going to be important um, as we move from the sort of delays and postponements of the pandemic um, that meant the uh, talks were put back to the sort of new 
um, uh, framework and, and timeline for negotiation under the uh, COP15 that is now opened in Kunming, um, but will really um, reconvene in Kunming in April and May next year for the negotiations. And in between, uh, there'll be serious negotiation sessions in Geneva in January, some three weeks, I think, of parallel sessions across the science, the implementation and negotiations, trying to really get together a package that can be negotiated and signed off for the next 10 years in Kunming. So there's a lot of work to do. And there'll be some contentious areas, including, for example, the 30 by 30 target. This is a, a, a target to try and protect 30% of the, of the world's land and 30% of uh, marine areas um, by 2030 and the, um, the, the sort of uh, questions over whether that is the right um, target and what then those area targets actually mean in practice, what protection actually constitutes is going to be contentious. So um, there's a lot to debate. Um, Xi Jinping fortunately has opened those talks with um, you know, a commitment, um, the most substantive parts of that so far being a commitment to a new um, biodiversity fund uh, into which he's put 1.5 billion yuan. Um, a, a few countries have now stepped up to add to that fund, but there's a lot of big questions. The, um, you know, it's, it's a drop in the ocean. The, the amount of money that's needed um, uh, to reverse global biodiversity decline is, of course, far more. One estimate is $700 billion. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the need then to accelerate this uh, is going to be a big question. So finance is going to be a huge uh, one on the, the agenda. The other thing that Xi Jinping announced was um, a new system of national parks in China, which I think is going to be important and relates again to those big questions around spatial planning and where we want to draw the, the lines. So the, um, there's a huge amount of work to do, and there's a huge amount of potential work that can be done in linking um, the CBD COP15 and UNFCCC COP26 agendas at Glasgow. Um, the UNFCCC doesn't contain its own nature conservation sort of aspect particularly, but there is a nature-based solutions track, which is co-chaired by China um, at, the, at, uh, at the UNFCCC. So it'd be interesting to see where there are alignments there. Uh, countries own so-called NDCs, their pledges to the climate convention can and do now uh, contain a lot of nature conservation pledges. So we might see some increase in ambition there as well, which would be interesting. But there's, um, you know, that there, there is time to uh, to put together an ambitious agenda before um, coming in April. Um, but there is a lot of work to do. So um, I hope we can have an interesting and productive discussion about um, where some of the entry points for that might be. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, it's always good to, you know, learn about China from sort of both inside and outside perspective, right? You know, putting China into a global context and also learning about what's happening inside China. I think our second speaker, Zhou Jingfeng, is going to zoom in a little bit further for us to look at this issue from a Chinese perspective. Now, Zhou Jingfeng is the Secretary General of China Biodiversity Conservation and the Green Development Foundation, which is a local independent NGO. Over to you, Jingfeng. Thank you. China has achieved uh, a great progress in biodiversity is, uh, from many aspects. The first from the law aspects, we have a uh, new environmental law. We have amended our wildlife protection law in 2016, and we have amended it uh, recently again. And uh, we have our endangered species list. I, unchanged for over 30 years, but recently we changed, we updated the China and the species. And besides the regulations, we also have big actions, including the 10 years ban of young zero uh, fishing and uh, the take uh, pangolin skill of auto of China pharmacopoeia, and uh, they're quite, we have done quite a lot. And uh, about, but I would like to emphasize them from the people sector. Uh, during this COP15 uh, first session uh, this month, uh, we broadcasting all major meetings, all major events, 
how many people we have online? We have 200, uh, 490,000 people, individuals, online visits to the broadcast in real time for the five days. And uh, we have published over uh, 1,000 article, uh, video, and uh, we saw uh, with those uh, uh, social media articles, we have over 100 million views within this month about the, the COP15. And uh, which means in China, people are really uh, participate and at least they are quite uh, aware of the importance. And uh, several years ago, we proposed to the government uh, to have a biodiversity law in China. Recently, we got a very confirmed positive response. We, China, are preparing to draft a China biodiversity law, which is, we think is a great start. For example, like uh, last year, January 2020, we write, we wrote to the authority and uh, only a, a week later, they published the, the wildlife eating ban in the, which was we did not satisfy. We wrote to the People's Congress again and the one month later, China People's Congress you showed the second ban decision on wildlife eating. And uh, for the last five years, we as a single independent organization, also the leading academic society in this sector in China, we set up over 170 uh, conservation areas to support the community conservations. We every year we fund, we support, we sponsor uh, over hundreds of grassroots NGO to participate in biodiversity. We have our we call for HBS instead of NBS, which is a very good. But uh, we in China we call human based uh, solution. We ask people to change. We wrote to CBD two years ago to ask them to use eco-civilization as the theme of COP15. Finally, they have uh, they accept uh, the suggestion because we think the protection of endangered species is not good enough. The protection of protected areas are not good enough. We people must change our way of life. We people must protect the biodiversity through in our neighborhood. So we have a new term called BCONBK, which is biodiversity conservation in our neighborhood. When we see our neighborhood, it's everywhere outside of state protected area. And uh, we call people's participation. And uh, nationwide, we have hundreds of thousands uh, registered uh, volunteers and they help us to watch out, to promote, to even to uh, ranger, to protect uh, those wild uh, nature, uh, including the uh, community conservation area, uh, including other natural uh, spaces, uh, which was not uh, which is not included in the state uh, protected area. And uh, finally, I would like to mention the Kunming Biodiversity Fund. Uh, we are the first one to respond to the call. And uh, the thick in the morning after the announcement of presidency of the Kunming Biodiversity Fund, and we set up a P2KB F, that is the people to Kunming Biodiversity Fund. And uh, we have the public fund the recent license in China. So we have people to participate to the fund. And the uh, first day we donate, uh, we promise to donate to the KBF, Kunming Biodiversity Fund, 
1 million RMB uh, as the initial, and uh, we are getting more and more people participate through our people's path to KBF. Thank you. Oh, Vincent, sorry, we can't hear you. Sorry, I accidentally muted myself. That's the, uh, <laughs> um, what happens on uh, when you work from home and doing things from Zoom. Um, can you hear me okay now, right? Yeah, perfect. Great, fantastic. Thanks, Hannah. Um, and also thanks to Jing Feng. I think it's particularly encouraging to hear what people in China are doing on this front and uh, how organizations like Jing Feng's getting people involved uh, in uh, you know pursuing uh, biodiversity um, and also protect our environment. Now we just heard from a thinker which is Sam and also a duo which is Jing Feng and um, you may wonder what's driving China to make such an effort to tackle these issues and where are we now in terms of conservation governance so our first third speaker is Dr. Guo Li, uh, who is with King's College London. She's going to help us answer this question. Guo Li, over to you. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be on this panel with you. Um, oh, sorry, I, sorry, I'm having some problem with my computer. We can hear you fine. Well, while Scully is uh, uh, sorting out her uh, technology issue, um, just a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, please do send them our way, uh, put them in Q&A box, and we'll try to go through as many of them as possible when we enter the Q&A stage. All right. Um, I think whilst waiting for Guoli, why don't we introduce our fourth speaker, John, John Dosworth. Um, John, um, John, are you there? Hi, Vincent. Yep. No, I'm Hi, here. great. Fantastic. Well, thanks for uh, coming in. Um, I wanted, John, you know, maybe you would want to explain, you know, what your research was about. You know, first of all, congratulations on winning this uh, uh, prestigious award, uh, 2021 Young China Watchers as his contact, contest. Um, I think you are going to talk to us about China's role in curbing deforestation, aren't you? Could yeah. you tell us a bit more about your research, please? Of course. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Vincent. Um, as a side note, um, my thoughts today are, are very much from me uh, rather than WWF as an organization, but it's, um, it's a pleasure to be part of a panel. And I'll aim to cover how China's agricultural expansion has led to deforestation and biodiversity loss, um, China's role in supporting con cons conservation overseas through its overseas investment, and finally, looking at potential policy responses and how China can play a leading role in greening global supply chains. So really to kick off, over, the last two decades of uh, economic growth, it's enabled China's leaders to make considerable strides in increasing, increasing food access across the country. But this economic growth has also generated a new set of demographic demands and environmental strains, um, both inside China, but crucially also outside. Um, and this e rapid economic growth has unleashed uh, demographic and also environmental trends that have hampered China's domestic agricultural production, um, both for a growing urban middle class, which has driven a demand for meat products, but also the degradation of agricultural land and water sources. And really, prior to 2014, China very much had been uh, a net exporter of food, 
but a combination of increasing population size and change in diet has actually seen China become the world's largest importer of food. And, um, and with current estimates, China is now the world's largest single importer of soy, beef, and timber, as well as the world's second largest importer of palm oil. And really to frame this, China has a unique economic and political influence on critical commodity markets that do drive deforestation. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, in other words, China's actions have the power to make or break the ambitions of producer countries to eliminate deforestation from particular supply chains. Um, and really in terms of how China's role in supporting conservation overseas, I'd like to sort of look slightly more closely at overseas investment and responsible sourcing. So as we know, China has become a top trading partner of over 120 countries and regions, including the United States and the EU, but crucially also in areas such as Latin America, Western Central Africa and Southeast Asia and, and the Pacific Islands. And the reason really I'd like to sort of narrow in on both Latin America for the Amazon and Cerrado, um, West Africa for the Congo Basin and Southeast Asia and the Pacific for remaining intact rainforests. And if we have time during the q and it would be good to talk about the links between carbon and, uh, and forests as well, linked to climate change. But with this, China's increased reliance on imports has in turn posed new questions for Chinese, for Chinese food security, and nowhere are these dynamics clearer than in the case of soy. And driven, as mentioned previously, primarily by an increased meat consumption um, due to an expanding middle class, China has, in a relatively short amount of time, become the world's largest importer of soybeans. And these trade flows are crucial, and that and during during the pandemic have actually increased you know increased significantly but now around 60 percent of china's soy comes from both brazil and argentina now where can china play a role and while we've often spoken on the government side of things i'd like to briefly mention the private sector and so cofco international which has revenues in 2018 of approximately 31 billion dollars they are the overseas arm of China's largest food and agriculture company. And they secured $2.3 billion as a sustainability uh, linked loan. And the significance of this is it's the largest ever by a commodities trader globally, but it's also the, it's the first ever by a Chinese corporate. <clears throat> and really from, in my opinion, there's an opportunity for Kofco to become a leader or Kofco International to become a leader in China but also to set a standard for ch Chinese companies going forward overseas. Finally, um, to just briefly touch upon potential policy responses for China to play a leading role in greening global supply chains, trade regulations and standards uh, for the import of soft and hard, hard commodities linked to forest lands is referenced in the 14th five-year plan. Um, which was announced this year, and that presents a framework to develop rules and standards for commodities, but one could recognize and recognize the international nature of supply chains. Secondly, to strengthen the import controls on agricultural commodities to cover both food security and the sustainability of forest lands. And the third, a commitment to cooperate on agricultural trade internationally. Now, to summarize on this point, Overseas investment on forest lands, as mentioned, you know, China's overseas footprint is significant and is expected to grow. As a global trade, as a global trading player, China has the opportunity to play a role with the enforcement of stricter standards on overseas investment and the further greening of investments. And this could be enabled through you know, the implementation of tools such as the green light system for Belt and Road projects, which is classifying the level of environmental impact of projects which is helping to flag the potential risks at an early stage. And while there's not enough time to discuss in this sort of brief overview, an area where I think there is huge opportunity linked to both um, CBD, but also COP26 is the Chinese banking sector. Now the Chinese banking sector are providing financing into both palm oil, soy and beef sectors, according to recent reports. And these three commodities, according to the WRI between 20, 2001 and to 2015, were significant causes of forest loss. 
And rather than going to this, rather than going to this now, this is another area where China could take a leading role. Um, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much, John. Um, I think um, we have got Lee back online. Lee, can you hear us? Yes. Great, fantastic. Yes. Fantastic. Welcome back. Um, Thank you. So, uh, you know, we were just saying, you know, maybe you could start from, you know, talking about your research uh, about this whole governance issue, you know, trying to guide us through, you know, how this whole governance issue has, has changed, how it evolved, and looking forward, um, what is going to happen on this front. Over to you. Thank you. Um, apologies um, for the tech problems. It's a little bit unstable um, at three o'clock in the morning from Canada. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure again to be on this panel. And this event uh, is uh, very meaningful for me. As often as a researcher, um, oftentimes when I tell people that I study China's biodiversity governance, people do not know how to react. And when I mention national parks in China, they would say, uh, so China does have national parks or China does not have national parks. Um, so what about the pandas? Um, so what I'm getting at is that uh, biodiversity conservation in China hasn't uh, been on public radar in the way that other many other environmental issues have been, such as the smog, the, the air apocalypse, and uh, water pollution, and in recent years the uh, climate issues. Uh, even though these are uh, they are all directly related to biodiversity. Um, so I think it's uh, overdue, uh, not just for my benefit, uh, to take a tally on China's uh, conser uh, conservation efforts and to have uh, conversations about how the world uh, can move forward together with China for post-2020 uh, action plan in saving the planet. So with limited time in the introduction, I would just make uh, just a few points about the China's uh, conservation governance. Uh, first of all, China has been uh, facing tremendous challenges in biodiversity as its economy grows. Um, we can use China's species account, uh, uh, species count and extinction risk as an example. Um, uh, 2015 WWF report found that half of China's terrestrial vertebrate vertebrate species, uh, that's a key indicator of biodiversity richness, um, was lost since 1970. Uh, and the most recent uh, na national red list assessment um, found similar sobering results that both Chinese vertebrates and high plant, high, higher plants are in a higher risk for extinction than the global average. Um, and the second point, uh, as Dr. Gill and Dr. Joe have uh, nicely laid out, uh, so is uh, uh, Vincent, uh, uh, um, China has uh, made a lot of efforts to combat biodiversity loss, both in international cooperation and on um, domestic fronts. In recent years, it has ramped up big reforms and implemented uh, ambitious policies to step up conservation efforts. And at the heart of its, uh, if its um, wide ranging efforts uh, is a sweeping reform to build China's own national parks and reset its system of protect areas. And as a backgrounder, protect areas are the primary mechanisms supporting biodiversity conservation uh, around the world. And China's modern uh, protect area movement dates back to the 1930s. But it's only uh, since the 1980s, China's conservation sector truly started to take off. And over the past three to four decades, the number of the protected areas um, in China grew from 34 to up to uh, 12,000. And the coverage area grow, grows 131 times. However, um, the growing protected areas struggled to function because of its uh, fragmented bu bureaucratic setups and the lack of coordination. 
And the central government has attempted to mend the system, but could not succeed until the national park reform in 2013. So what, what was this reform about? Um, first of all, uh, it introduced a, a new type of protected areas, national parks, uh, to China's conservation system, uh, which is more in line uh, with the IUCN category two or the Yellowstone style of national parks, as you know. Um, and second, it resets or uh, try to reset the entire protect, protected area system. Um, still ongoing for us at, at the moment, at least to put the previously fragmented and often locally captured protected areas under one top administrative agency and uh, streamlined it. Um, so this, the third point I want to make is about the, the factors uh, driving uh, the big reforms like this. So um, domestically, I think, uh, at least two forces are at play. And the first is obviously the political because national park reform was one of the signature reforms um, in President Xi's uh, ecologic civilization campaign since 2013. And second is the, the reform is the result of the advocacy by conservation community and NGOs. Uh, some, uh, conservation experts have been uh, very active in advocating uh, overall system reform for protected areas since the early 2000s. And also the ideas of building national parks uh, came from grassroots initiatives. It was the environmental NGOs who first experimented with local government in Yunnan to create national parks for better protection, uh, protection results. And the last point I wanted to make is about the prospects of uh, conservation uh, from the governance angle. Um, so one feature for China's recent conservation uh, reform is that the decision making is top down and the public consultation has been increasingly restricted to elite experts. And this top down decision making has its advantages, but also uh, created big problems. Sometimes it can go very extreme. For example, when the national park reform was, uh, the decision was announced, even the, the top policy experts in Beijing was very surprised because they did not know why the government suddenly wanted to build national parks, not to say what kind of parks to build. Um, and the reform process um, naturally was bumpy as a result of this ambiguity. Uh, moving forward, there will be a lot at stake as China has mainstream biodiversity into the uh, national five years plan, the 14th five year plan. And among many things, it would be uh, more promising for a big and steady progress if the public is more genuinely engaged in the reform process. That's my uh, inter uh, remarks and thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Lee. Um, I think um, we have all four speakers providing their perspectives, uh, certainly a very diverse range of perspective, uh, I'm delighted to say. And um, I think we have uh, 20 minutes also to go to Q&A. If you have any questions, please do send them my way. Now, before we start a uh, formal discussion, uh, there is a really interesting question, actually. I think sometimes you, when we talk about these broad uh, policy issues, uh, we uh, miss the sort of uh, you know, a 101 basics uh, of this entire uh, foundation. Uh, we have this question from Susanna, uh, who asked, could one of the panelists answer, what is the link between air pollution and the forests um, and deforestation? Um, could, um, um, John, do you want to kickstart? How would you, in your succinct language, uh, in one sentence uh, to answer this question? I'll try. I'll try as best as <laughs> I can there, Vincent, with what with, with one line. I think. Um, I think, in particular, with air pollution, what we're seeing is we are seeing associated um, air pollution issues, especially with uh, forest fires and deforestation, in particularly Southeast Asia. Um, and so there is a clear link there. But I also think one of the things that's 
that the wider link between deforestation and climate change is very much around this point that deforestation affects people and animals more widely around the, the point that 80 percent of the lands animals and plants live in forests and so those those areas in particular are um as soon as deforestation is it you know impacts there well from what you actually do you, you have the associated impacts then on cities and 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 more urban areas so more the the final thing i would say on that is we're seeing for instance with the congo basin right now which you know to, to everyone sort of in, in western central africa is the weather changes due to deforestation there will actually impact east africa and north africa both through changes in weather patterns but also um associated risks so that may not quite answer it just the specifics on air pollution but the change in weather patterns is actually a significant thing. And we're seeing that in China as well at the moment as well. Yeah, exactly. This is why you know, people pay so much attention to COP26, which is due to commence next next week. Um, I wanted, though, um, you know, we are talking about COP15, COP26, biodiversity, climate crisis, in a context of a changing uh, Chinese economic structure, which has proven to be quite uh, Bumpy, uh, to to put it this way, um, and for many years, you know, people do associate with pollution, um, biodiversity loss, uh, to China's high economic growth. Um, going forward, uh, Jingfeng, from your perspective, how do we balance these two contradictions? Um, is China ready to do enough? And if so, what exactly can China do? Uh, they're allowed to do, and uh, the, this too, uh, we must compromise. And I would like to take an example like uh, the mooncake. In China, every year we have uh, 10 billion uh, of yuan uh, annually industry for, mo to, uh, for, for mooncake. But the packaging is so huge, it's not, it's, it's ridiculous. When I was young, there is one single small piece of paper to wrap up the mooncake. But today you have such huge packaging. And although that costs a lot, we cannot afford to live that way. We must cut down, slow down, shrink the mooncake industry, or I mean the packaging industry. And uh, the, econ the economy development is the number one issue for climate as well as for biodiversity. We must change the way to develop in the economy. We must not, uh, we must hold uh, the groups. We must, we do need a better life. We need good uh, mooncake, but we do not need those packaging. But the industry, the economy today are making all those kind of packaging, I mean, Many things not really needed. The heavy, the, the, air, the, the railway, and we have so many heavy in railway. It's very important, but we have too many of them, which fragmented our motherland and which uh, destroyed the habitats of wildlife. We must change. Thank you. Mm, that's a very good message, we must change. But Sam, China's economy is now so interconnected to the rest of the world. Um, if moon, packa moon cake packaging um, is slashed in, 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 to some extent, um, how much is it going to affect the rest of the world? Because it's so interconnected. You know, we're talking about this painful transition in China. And what is the view from your part of the world? Yeah, so there's, I guess, a lot of scrutiny at this point, particularly going into Glasgow, about what China's commitments are going to look like. Um, you know, China has yet to submit its, its pledge, its so-called nationally determined contribution or NDC to the uh, to the COP26 process. So there's a lot of questions right at the moment about exactly how ambitious China's going to be. And the reason people are asking that is not only, as you say, because of it, because it, it signals how um, uh, ambitious China is going to be domestically, but also because that has knock-on effects internationally. Uh, you can't look at that 
um, in isolation. An obvious area is in the export of China's sort of capital uh, through um, things like the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, it's a, it's a very uh, complex and big topic that's you know being better addressed on some other panels um, this week uh, at, at, during the King's sort of China Week. But you know, very briefly, I don't see that as one overarching master plan, um, but. A, a, a symptom of a growing economy that needs to find an escape valve for surplus capital. And so in order to uh, sort of channel that capital, one creates, uh, you know, what people have called a kind of a geographic fix, where essentially you create new avenues, new corridors for trade and connectivity, um, where investment can go. Now, what that's meant in the Chinese case is a, a sort of a choice which is to say, do you really promote China's best practices, its most innovative industries, its, so, its leading solar sector, its leading um, uh, clean technology sectors, or does this escape valve end up um, as a way for some of, some of the kind of failing industries in China, let's say that the most polluting mooncake packaging factories, to keep with that analogy, um, to set up in, uh, in developing countries that urgently need and you know rightly are, are are looking for foreign direct investment you know we're in a in a moment in the global economy post pandemic where a lot of countries are facing like a really acute fiscal crisis um really do need uh finance and and you know we'll welcome uh, investment in new infrastructure and so on that's sorely needed but it's also for for reasons of equity and you know the urgency of the climate and nature crisis also should be going to the most appropriate and uh you know environmentally friendly projects china has a wealth of new expertise in those areas and also has um, a lot of capital to to spend the question is how is that really going to go into the right places and there's a lot of good frameworks and so on coming out china has new guidelines on the belt and road for example that specifically look at um uh, so-called traffic light system to signal, um, you know, which are the best projects that should, um, you know, receive a, a generous credit line and so on from China's policy banks, uh, and which should be, um, you know, cut off. Um, and most importantly, at the UN General Assembly in September, um, Xi Jinping made a unilateral statement that uh, China would stop financing or stop building coal overseas, um, and by implication financing, I believe. Um, and that China would make an effort to, to fund green energy overseas. Now, we're talking here about nature conservation rather than energy, but I think what's important um, is, well, firstly, there's an intersection there, of course, but also, um, you know, Xi Jinping made a statement about this, this Kunming Biodiversity Fund, which I think is really focused again on the developing world. I do think this is a really important moment uh, for countries more broadly to, to you know, mm. uh, take something from, from that opening statement and think about how to, um, you know, if they are recipients of Chinese finance, for example, how to make sure that they are getting the, the greenest possible uh, sort of standards and options and projects. Mm. Interesting. Thanks, Sam. Listen, uh, yes, listen, please. My talk is thank you. And uh, we received uh, quite a few uh, mm. call from South, uh, from Africa, from uh, Southeast Asia. They ask us to stop some Chinese program there because of uh, chimpanzee, because of the coal power station, the environment issues. We're trying really hard. The industry talked to me, do you know how much does it mean for the industry, for the Chinese industry to build the coal power station in Africa. They explained the machine, the building, the fund, the all of them are from China. And I'm really struggling in, in this kind of issues. But you know, recently President Xi announced we're not going to build coal power station overseas as well which means we do change to fit, to feed the shared future for all lives on earth. And we must, I mean, this is a very high level understanding and action and uh, advice. But uh, for those business, for those industry of China, they need to understand, to learn and to change, to feed this 
global emergencies of climate and biodiversity. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Jingfeng. Um, we've got a question uh, for Li. Um, has the conservation of national parks made a significant difference in addressing environmental degradation? Um, thanks uh, for the question. The national park, uh, um, the national park and protected areas uh, was um, the reform started in two thousand thirteen, and it's really uh, took some momentum uh, during um, two thousand fifteen. In, in two thousand fifteen and in two thousand seventeen, it started to take shape, um, meaning the the central government started to have a, a real plan on the the you know how, how the whole system supposed was supposed to look like like it's um decided to create a protected area system um with uh, uh, national parks as the mainstay meaning a main component even though the meaning of it was some kind of still a uh, vague uh, but with also with it's a original primary uh, category of protected area, the nature reserve, uh, as a, um, a foundation, meaning it will still keep those uh, um, reserves um, running uh, as, a, as a main type of protected area. But then it will uh, sort out all the other protected areas, because previously there were like 20 or 30, 40, if you count all kinds of like um, different uh, protected areas. Um, as uh, na nature parks. So at that time, there was this, this plan. Um, and then uh, I think the national park reform uh, continued to roll out pretty, pretty well, uh, even though there was small delay, uh, possibly due to the, the COVID. And the, um, there were, uh, many of them have set up the main administration and developed the, the uh, New park standards uh, and uh, 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 connected previous uh, fragmented parts, uh, uh, conservation areas within the parks. So by um, I think uh, the 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 time of the COP fifteen uh, in Kunming, the first session of it, uh, President Xi announced the five of them as full parks already. At at the same time, the protected areas uh, of our kinds basically were all put in the streamlined fashion. Um, uh, the manifest and um, the effects were not uh, not immediately clear at this this point because uh, I think it's slow moving because it's a, it's a huge uh, system. Um, for, for give you an example. I think there are at least uh, sixty uh, million people living near uh, around the, the those protected areas. So the mm -hmm. the impact is large, but uh, hopefully it will overcome the reform. Have to overcome the previous. Um, uh, uh, fragmentation and overlapping jurisdictions and help um, set uh, uniform standards, even though um, the experimentation with uh, national parks uh, previously um, would uh, also cater to the each local situation uh, depends on how the, the protected areas are run. So it, it is hopeful, uh, at least for the attention and also for uh, the, 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 um, the, the efforts it's um, ramped up um, to to reset the um, the system. Yeah, and I have already seen a lot of people on social media, you know, talking enthusiastically about uh, this uh, whole national park plan. And a lot of people asking, are we going to have a national park in the area we live in? Um, thank you, Lee, for, for the answer. We've got another question. Um, obviously, the elephant in the room is the COP26 and what China is going to do. There's a lot of uh, global expectation. We've got a question coming in asking, what does it mean if President Xi doesn't appear at COP26? Is this a worrying sign China doesn't believe in global cooperation on climate action? Sam, would you like to take on this challenge? Yeah, I think uh, I've been asked this a lot and I think it's an easy one to answer actually. I don't think that's what it means, um, uh, straightforwardly. Uh, Xi Jinping hasn't uh, attended any global conferences since um, the pandemic. Um, he, he even sent a video message to the opening of the Kunming um, uh, CBD conference that we're, uh, that we're discussing. Um, however, the Chinese delegation will be at uh, COP26, led by Xie Jianhua, who is a very important negotiator, um, 
uh, and you know one of the architects effectively of, of Paris. He has a very good, long, deep working relationship with his US counterpart, John Kerry, which I think is a very important signal for cooperation. The most important signal that China is staying the course on Paris really is the um, uh, unilateral statements that Xi Jinping has made at uh, the last two UN General Assemblies, again by video message, but in both cases showing very clearly that China is committed to uh, global climate action, um, first the 2060 uh, carbon neutrality goal, and, and secondly this commitment on not uh, building coal overseas. This, it should be remembered, is not a treaty negotiation like uh, Copenhagen or Paris. It's a, uh, it, it's a really important one about raising ambition. And there is some symbolic importance to, to uh, leaders attending. I won't deny that. But I think the most important thing that we can do now, particularly post-pandemic, is try to restore trust in the process, try to use COP26 to show that there is some uh, you know, room for increasing ambition, increasing momentum, getting countries back on track, particularly giving a signal of solidarity to the most vulnerable, poorest countries who urgently need finance and, uh, and support. So I, I, I don't think that Xi Jinping's um, uh, attendance or, or absenteeism one way or the other is that significant, to be honest. Right. Thanks very much, Sam. And there's a lot of uh, interest uh, globally on what China is going to do next. Um, but um, obviously, uh, John, there is a, a lot of, uh, you know, interest domestically as well. We've got a question from Michael, who asks, what is happening in China around ivory rhino horns, pangolin scales, and other critically endangered species that are used in traditional medicine? Are public attitudes changing dramatically? Are there any large public awareness raising campaigns? Uh, you know, you uh, work as a campaigner and you've been following China, Asia for a long time. Um, would you like to take on this challenge? I think this is our last question. Vincent, I'll, I'll give it my best shot, but I may also defer to Jim Fung because I'm, I'm fully aware of his experience in this area as well. Um, I think one of the things we are seeing is we're seeing a greater awareness from um, the youth in China and in terms of their attitudes um, on many issues. And one of them is around um, sustainability, the circular economy, and also traditional Chinese medicine is one of those areas. I think um, the ivory ban was significant. Um, and in terms of uh, the campaign where you had Chinese celebrities involved in that, and I think that was effective. I think now, there is uncertainty in terms of the space available um, for non-state actors um, to operate in this space, especially around behavior change. Um, and I think I may defer to Jing Feng just to speak more, yeah, in, in more depth on this. But I think that there has been, there has been progress, but I think that there's also challenges. You know, I think there is draft legislation to outlaw the criticism, for instance, of traditional Chinese medicine, which is in itself a significant, a significant move, which then narrows the space for, um, you know, Great. influencing campaigns. Jingfeng, is this also what you are hearing in China, experiencing as well, just very quickly? Thank you. And, uh... 2019 February, I visited the, the state administration for Chinese traditional medicine and asked them to take a pangolin scale out of China from Copia. They told me, go get lost. 2019 February. But last year, we finally got it out of the pharmacopoeia. And uh, the people, the public, are getting more aware of this. And, uh, but we still face in the industry they want to eat me all. And uh, they're trying to push to get their business growing. And uh, we believe we will, get, we will win the bottle eventually, but we have a hard one even today. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, a lot of work to be done, Jingfeng. So uh, may I also comment what you are doing in China, because this is a, such a, such an important issue, um, not just to China, but also to the rest of the world. Um, I would like to thank we all our panelists, uh, Jingfeng, uh, Sam, Lee, and John. Um, 
thank you for your participation. You know, one of our listeners said, thank you for the informative, thoughtful webinar. Uh, all kudos to you guys um, for providing us with an overview, also with a lot of detail. Thank you also uh, to our audiences, wherever you are in China or in Europe or in America for dialing in. And over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Vincent. Um, I echo your thanks to our speakers for sharing all of your insights and expertise today, and also for your broader work in this area, because it is so important. And we really appreciate what you're doing um, to tackle these challenges and then share that work with us to um, create awareness about these issues. Thanks, Vincent, for being an absolutely fabulous uh, panel moderator as usual. And thank you to our guests for tuning in to this event as part of China Week. And a big shout out to Lee as well for joining us at 3 a.m. in uh, Canada. That, that's a really incredible effort. Thank you, Lee. Um, we do have plenty more events on for the remaining uh, few days of China Week. So we have a hybrid event this afternoon on the Green Belt and Road. So that, that's happening in person at King's, but also streamed online for those across the world. Uh, then we have a film screening this evening of The Mermaid. And we have a webinar and, a, sorry, a hybrid event tomorrow morning on Young Voices Driving Change. And I note that John mentioned that um, at the end of his remarks around youth in China and their role uh, in championing environmental action. So we're going to be looking at that and how that feeds into COP26 when there's these high-level discussions going on, but we want to hear from the voice of young people and students. Um, and then I also wanted to finally mention that uh, a big thanks to China Dialogue for partnering uh, with us on this event today, as well as on China Week more broadly. And we've just published an article by Lee Gore today uh, in China Dialogue. So check that out to, uh, to hear um, her expanded views in this area.